We this is going to be uh, agitators and organizers of labor. Uh, the two panelists that you have today are John Beck and Samuel Cap. I'm the moderator. I'm Charles Griffin. Uh, John Beck is an associate professor in the School of Human Resources and Labor Relations at MSU. He previously served as the associate director of the school, primarily in charge of the two of the school's outreach uh, units, the Labor Education Program and Union Management in Initiatives. He also co-directs a project with uh, Karen Klomperens, the Dean of the MSU Graduate School, uh, Building Mutual Expectations and Resolving Conflicts in Graduate Education on the use of inter interest-based conflict resolution approaches for grad students and their faculty members. John holds degrees from MSU and the University of Michigan. He worked for five years on the staff of the U of M Labor Studies Center, and he has taught labor studies on the community college level in both Oklahoma and Michigan, and has taught history and education courses at the university level. Uh, Sam Kapp was born in 1997 in Rostovandan, Russia. Adopted in 1998, he was raised in a suburb of Indianapolis where he completed his K-12 education. Sam graduated high school in the spring of 2015 and uh, then attended NYU in the fall. Bouncing around academic disciplines for over a year, he decided to, to suspend his traditional education. And for approximately two years, he ventured out into the country and explored its most spectacular areas in a converted minivan. In 2018, he decided to continue his education here at NMU beginning that fall. Uh, passionate about nature, he helped found the NMU conservation crew and joined the Upper Peninsula Land Co uh, Conservancy as a student board member. He is currently writing uh, the writing TA for the NMU's history department and plans to graduate with a degree in history this coming spring. Uh, so, John, Sam, you guys can take over from here. I don't know who's presenting first. Well, uh, I think just from a well, Sam, do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? Sam is having some issues with his video uh, chat. Well, you know, my like video chat, it doesn't really, it it's sputters in and out. So I think, you know, if, you, if everybody can hear me and that works. Okay. Oh, I can hear you. All right, great. Yeah, if you want to go first, that's perfectly fine. Okay. So uh, Dan Truckee was nice enough to ask me to, to speak about uh, a depression era um, event that took place in Evan Junction. Uh, it's a red flag case that ended up in the Michigan Supreme Court uh, called People versus uh, Eminent. And I want to give you a little bit of background on that. It actually follows on an earlier court case called People versus Berman that I'm happy to, to talk about once we get to the, the question and answer thing or put it into discussion at that point. So let me uh, begin. On Saturday, August 5th, 1933, a group of American legionnaires from the Alger County Club in Munising decided to drive to Ebon Junction to check out the activities going on at the town's Finn Hall. Two of the four legionnaires who drove over were also deputy sheriffs. The activity at the hall was a children's camp for the Young Pioneers, a communist children's organization. When the legionnaires arrived, they found a red flag with a hammer and sickle embroidered upon it flying on the flagpole outside the hall. The group called the state police who arrived an hour later. Confronted with a group of children singing ringed around the flagpole, the state police moved them aside, chopped down the flagpole and confiscated the red flag. The manager of the Unity Co-op, Pale Berman, walked over to the legionnaires and inquired what business it was of theirs as to what flag was flying. Deputy Sheriff Arsenault informed that the Finns had to fly an American flag. Deputy Sheriff Robert told him, we are making it our business. After the police left, the children at the camp sewed together four red handkerchiefs and flew them from the flagpole which they re-erected. The next morning, the state troopers returned to Evan Junction, met Sheriff Peltier and his deputies, removed the new flag and chopped the flagpole into stove lengths. Two men who had uh, some disputed link to the children's camp, Eric Foley Berman and Unto Immanen, were arrested under the state of Michigan's red flag law, which had been passed in 1929 and also under the state's Criminal Syndicalism Act, which dated from 1919. It is probably important to mention in the side that communist children's camps were a natural outgrowth of Hall socialism. 
The Finnish radicals' use of community and cultural life is one cornerstone of the larger political life. Harassment of camps often came at the hands of those who the Finns regarded to be Ku Klux Klan or American Legion men. Passing on the group's cultural and political values has a colorful history, which includes socialist Sunday schools within the Socialist Party and a wide range of communist activities for children, including the scout-like young pioneers. This is not only true of the Finns, but among other ethnic radical groups and within the Socialist and Communist parties more generally. However, the Finns did gain a reputation among adherents of both parties for being especially ardent in their use of Hall socialism as a brand of political life. Tear gas, tear gas rather, was used the following day when Finn sympathizers demonstrating at the jail building became unruly with threats to free both Berman and Eminem. Despite the demonstration, Berman and Eminem were arraigned on August 30th on only the charge of violation of the state's red flag law. Defense attorney for the pair was Henry Paul, a lawyer from Duluth who gained quite a reputation at that time for taking up labor and left-wing clauses. This, the decision not to prosecute Berman and Eminem under the state's criminal syndicalism law may have been related to the law's notoriety earlier in the year when it was used against protesters at farm foreclosure riots and to the, the subsequent entry of two repeal bills in the Michigan legislature by Republican state representative and farmer James Hellman. Radicalism was on trial with the defendants. Though it could not be proven that the 51-year-old Berman had anything to do with the children's camp or the raising of the flags, he had to be guilty because he was a prominent communist in the community. Berman had appeared on the communist ticket for the office of probate judge on the 1932 ballot. Evan resident Victor Heyre indicated that Berman was known to be the leader of the communists in Evan Junction. He had moved to Evan Junction in 1931 Two later district organizers for the Communist Party, John Vita and Matt Savala, used their role as head of the local Unity Co-op store as the base for their party work in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Eminent had a more demonstrable tie to the children and their flag. One prosecution witness, again, Victor Heyre, claimed to watch Eminent direct the children as they raised the flagpole the second time with the red handkerchief flag. The 22-year-old uh, Eminent had been hired to provide physical education for the children, and he and his wife, Ruth Lake Eminent, were also, were also were, were responsible for teaching the, the children history and other subjects at the camp. Outside of the one witness, however, the prosecution could not prove that Eminent had any role in the actual flag raising. Like Berman, Eminent's uh, guilt was more solidly linked to his speech in an anti-war rally where he made remarks against the Civilian Conservation Corps and to his common law marriage to Ruth Lake Eminent. Defense attorney Henry Paul argued that the prosecution had not proven his client's connection to the red flags. Defense witnesses had testified that Berman had only stopped time to time for coffee at the Finn Hall and had picked up grocery orders from the two Finn women who cooked for the children. Otherwise, he had no role in the camp. Paul argued that the fact that his clients were communists, which Berman had admitted under oath, was not proof enough that they had violated the Michigan red flag law. Oddly enough, the current Communist Party uh, national newspaper, The Daily Worker, had asked communists to come to the aid of Berman and Eminent under the subheadline, Director of Pioneer Camp and Teacher Arrested. A special prosecutor was brought in by the state of Michigan to argue the case against Berman and Eminem. John J. O'Hara was from Menominee, Michigan, also in the UP, lawyer who traveled to Munising to represent the case. The rising level of radicalism within the ranks of the state's farmers, workers, and unemployed may have been reason enough for State Attorney General Patrick H. O'Brien to send O'Hara to ensure a victory against Berman and Eminem. Attorney General Patrick H. O'Brien had been elected in the November election of 1932, which also brought Franklin Roosevelt to the presidency. It was a long time since O'Brien had defended workers and worker compensation uh, cases in Calumet and socialists in a red flag case in Hancock, which I can talk about more a little later. Patrick H. O'Brien had become a major figure in the Democratic Party and had finally taken a larger office from the circuit court judgeship, which he had held in the Keweenaw. O'Brien held his judgeship uh, in the Emperor Peninsula from 1912 to 1922. 
He seconded Wilson's nomination for the presidency in the 1912 Democratic Convention. And as chief counsel for the American Civil Liberties Union, he won in federal court on the unconstitutionality of Michigan's Alien Registration Act. Berman and Eminem were found guilty of two violations of the Michigan Red Flag Law. The law allowed heavy penalties and on October 20th, uh, 29th, 1933, the, jur the judge ordered Berman to serve two consecutive three-year terms at hard labor on, in Michigan, in Marquette State Prison, rather. He ordered Eminem to serve two consecutive two-year terms at hard labor in Marquette Prison as well. The men were taken from Munising Jail to Marquette two days later. Henry Paul appealed the case to the Michigan Supreme Court. For the appeal, he enlisted the aid of Michigan labor attorney Maurice Sugar, who was already building his reputation as a defender of unionists and radicals. Paul argued that the Michigan law was unconstitutional, but it was not on that basis that both men were granted new trials on May 17, 1935. Instead, the Michigan Supreme Court agreed with Paul's assertion that the lower court had erred in allowing evidence on Berman and Eminent's Communist Party activities. The Supreme Court ruled that the lower court had erred as well in its charge to the jury, which read in part, if the evidence in this case convinces you beyond a reasonable doubt that the party to which these defendants belong has an avowed, avowed hostility to the government and an open antagonism to all political parties which profess to support the same form of government, and my emphasis, then they would be guilty of anarchy according to the statute which I have just read. The Michigan Supreme Court could not allow the lower court to find Eminent and Berman guilty of a charge which was not possible under the provisions of the, red, of the state's red flag law. The law did not make communistic beliefs illegal just the raising of red flags to actually support such beliefs. On October 28, 1935, Circuit Court Judge Herbert W. Runnels, who had been so hostile during the trial to both the defendants and their counsel, accepted the prosecuting attorney's motion to drop the case against the two Finns rather than go through the time and money involved in retrying the issue. Besides the cost factor for depression strapped Alger County, prosecuting attorney C.L. Peters, who had not been in office at the time of the earlier trial, commented on the positive effect that resulted from the earlier overturned conviction. Quote, the defendants served several months in Marquette prison to the reversal of their former uh, uh, conviction, and it is felt that such punishment had a good enough effect upon propaganda and activities inimical to our government as a longer term would have, and has been an adequate warning to the defendants and others that such conduct will not be tolerated. Patrick O'Brien served only one term as Michigan's uh, Attorney General. He returned to private practice in Detroit late in 1934. His tenure as Attorney General included work on the reorganization of state of Michigan banks after the bank holiday, success in drafting and defending laws, establishing chain store and general sales taxes, among others, and successful prosecution of two Finn communists for violation of the, of the red flag law. Berman died uh, December 5th, 1937 of a heart attack in Evan Junction. The 55 year old radical had spent his life dedicated to radical causes as a union organizer and as a social activist and as a communist party functionary. In People versus Eminem, the state of Michigan tried both men for advocating the overthrow of the economic system an offense under the state syndicalism law, which they did not use in the charges against Berman and Eminem. Within the confines of the state's red flag law, such a uh, thing was not illegal, only the actual raising of red flags. Eric Berman was, uh, Folly Berman was a survivor within the ranks of Finnish American so Unionists, Socialists, and Communists. His untimely death at 55 has probably denied to him greater recognition for his role in the history of Finnish radicalism in the United States. It's ironic that his name actually is on an earlier 1907 case that Patrick O'Brien successfully overturned at the Supreme Court when Berman was arrested with others in Hancock for flying a red flag. And that his name is not on the latter case, prosecuted by O'Brien, and instead Unto Eminem, the young man who was a teacher, his name went on to live 
in constitutional history in Michigan because people versus imminent is regarded as an important case. Thank you so much. I uh, look forward to questions later. Thank you so much, John, for uh, speaking on that. Uh, Sam, are you ready now? Yeah, let me just see if I can share my screen. So I got a PowerPoint presentation, so. Gotcha. Uh, and everyone that's in the audience, just remember that you can throw a question in the Q&A at any time, and there's going to be 15 minutes at the end or so to answer those questions. All right. Just make sure. All right. Today I'm speaking on the Gazard strikes of 1949 and the interconnectedness between those that occurred in Michigan and those in Indiana. I've reworked the title a bit from what is on the schedule, so I hope I haven't misled anyone. I would like to first thank Sandy Arsno, who, along with her husband, currently own the Gazard building in Ishpeming and has given me an extensive tour of the old factory. Additionally, I would like to thank Phyllis Wong, who has conducted numerous interviews with past Ishpeming Gazard workers for her willingness to converse with me on the events of 49. Now, you might have noticed that I have underlined the word strikes. The little research that has been conducted on this labor action is typically relegated to the events in Ishpeming. In actuality, the strike in Michigan ran parallel to Gazard strikes in Indiana. This previously dismissed relationship is important to understanding the movement in its entirety. I'm going to first provide a brief overview of the Gossard Company, then I'll discuss the strikes of 1949 and how the events in Michigan and Indiana were very much interwoven, pun intended. Now, the Gossard Company was and still is a ladies' undergarment manufacturer. Founded in 1901 by H.W. Gossard, the company's claim to fame, so to speak, was the front lacing corset, as advertised here. H.W. discovered this, corset, this style of corset while in Paris and recognized its potential. This revolutionary style allowed women to tie the garment themselves, no longer requiring the assistance of a maid or servant. Its health benefits were also lauded. However, these garments were initially very expensive, costing upwards of $625 in today's money. Prices eventually decreased by the 1920s to a more reasonable $40 in today's money, after the company grew and more factories were opened. Here's a map showing the factories that I will be discussing today. Ishpeming opened in 1920, followed by Logansport in 1930. A factory in Gwen, which operated as a satellite for Ishpeming, was opened in 1947. There is hardly any information on the Huntington plant, but it can be assumed that it was opened sometime between 1901 and 1949, and was, like Gwen, a satellite factory for Logansport. Both Ishpeming and Logansport had around 500 workers, while Gwen and Huntington each had approximately 150. These figures varied over the years, but they stayed close to these estimates. Now, the women in these factories mostly did piecework. This meant that wages were based on the amount of work completed in a certain time. Pictured here is one of the sewing machines from the early 1900s that was found in the Ishpeming factory. I took this picture, like many others in this presentation, while I toured the factory with Mrs. Arsenal. I'll give you a few moments to hypothesize as to what these are. My initial assumption was that there were some sort of lamp used in the manufacturing process, but there are actually devices that create the cups and bras, these three each different sizes. Pictured here is one of the carts that was used to carry different pieces throughout the factory. This machine, onomatopoetically dubbed the clicker, due to the sound it made while it was operating, was used to cut out different shapes of fabric and still located in the basement of the Ishpeming Gossard building. It was operated by the small number of men who worked there. Now, if some of you are wondering why I chose this garish green background, it's an homage to the color of green that was painted throughout the Gossard factory and used as seen here on their boxes. Pictured here is the old building in Ishmael in the late 1800s when it was still occupied by the Brasted department store. Towns like Ishmael were quite suitable for garment factories which relied on cheap, non-unionized labor. The women and girls, and I do say girls because many at the time were quite young, were willing to work for lower wages to help support their families. Now, before the factory opened in Ishmael, an ad was placed in the local newspaper, the Iron Ore, asking for workers. 
They hoped for a thousand, but the factory never reached this number, even at its height. This ad part is particularly interesting in that it is promising leadership positions to women in this plant. Uh, this is 1920. The 19th Amendment would be ratified in August of this year. So it's just neat to see this sort of progressive element displayed locally. The Eastman factory was opened on April 20th, 1920. Here is an article in the Mining Journal discussing that opening. As you can see, it's a relatively brief article and not too much is said on the matter. This is the current insight of the Ishpeming plant in one of the areas that retains much of its originality. So just imagine that space filled to the brim with workers. Pictured here is one of the staircases and exits to outside. While on the tour with Mrs. Arsenault, she said that at lunchtime and at the end of shifts, people avoided the area because of the stampede of women that would rush out the door. So imagine some 500 women eager to leave work crammed in the staircase and subsequently piling out onto the street. In Ishpeming, the factory employed a large number of workers, really only second to the mine, and thereby was quite prominent in the community. Here's a float from the July 4th parade of 1926 with some workers and management. Now on to Indiana. Compared to the Ishpeming opening, the Logansport opening had a tremendous amount of fanfare and news coverage. An entire edition of the local newspaper, the Pharaoh's Tribune, was dedicated to this factory, something that I could hardly imagine happening today. The reasons given as to why Logansport was chosen include location with regard to the chief sources of raw material, the nearness of Logansport to Chicago headquarters of the Gossard Company, and the fact that labor was available. These reasons were all given by management in one of the sections. Interestingly, Sandy Arsenault has said that she has found pallets at the Ishpeming Gossard with Logansport printed on them, suggesting that there was contact between the two factories. Even more interesting, she said that women from Indiana would come up here to train and then go back. I have not found any other evidence to corroborate this, but it does pose further questions on the pre-strike relationship between the plants. This is just another page in that edition showing the amount of thanks and congratulations that local businesses gave this factory, many of which discuss how the coming of the Gossard factory is proof of progress in Logansport. There is page after page of this. I'd like to add that coverage of the Gwen factory was minimal, and I couldn't find anything on the opening of the Huntington branch. As is with any research, the biggest hindrances are time and money, and I suppose now COVID-19, and I was therefore unable to travel to Indiana and poke around archives in the region, but hopefully I will be able to sometime soon. Jumping about 20 years now to the late 1940s, unfortunately due to time constraints, I can't go into the history of the factories during this interperiod, which is interesting in its own right. Efforts to unionize the Ishmeen factory failed during the years prior to the strike. Pictured here is Geraldine Gordon, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, ILGWU for short, representative from Chicago, who would come to lead the strike in Ishmael. She had also serviced the Logansport plant as a business agent where she trained the workers in collective bargaining. Next to her is Ruth Crane, her principal union contact at the Ishmael factory. At this time, the Indiana factories were already unionized. The upper tiers of Gossard management used the Ishmael and Gwen factories as experimental facilities where they could test new methods without the complications posed by union, by union shops. So there, there was this continuous threat to move work from unionized plants to non-unionized ones. However, in, 19, in 1948, with the help of Gordon, Crane, and others, Ishmael finally voted to unionize. The main grievance was the transition from a straight dollars and cents incentive plan to a more abstract point system that puzzled workers and saw their income, income decrease. Because styles of garments changed often, rates for piecework were always in flux. In Gordon's words, without the union, it became a sweatshop because the equality of work and earnings had no fair relationship. Here are some full page and nearly full page sections bought by management and the union, respectively, giving reasons for and against striking. The union was asking for a raise comparable to other unionized Gossard factories, a longer probationary period for new workers and a union shop. Management countered with a smaller raise and no union shop, much to the union's dismay. Most notably on the page to the left, management argues that current economic conditions prevent the company from compromising. 
The union retorts saying that they have plenty to give the workers as they have seen net profits of $86,000. On April 4th, the union in Nishmin voted to strike, 335 to 173. On April 12, 1949, nearly 200 women began picketing outside of the Ishmael factory, marking the first primarily female-led strike in UP history. To sort of bring you to the strike in a sense, I'm going to play a song that was sung on the picket lines. This version of We Shall Not Be Moved is sung by one of my favorite musicians, Pete Seeger. Let's take a listen. We shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's standing by the water. We shall not be moved. The union is behind us. We shall not be moved. The union is behind us. We shall not be moved. Just like a tree. That goes on for a little longer, uh, but hopefully everybody was able to hear that. Now, management tried to keep the factory operational during the first days of the strike, but they were unable to after 300 sympathetic United Steel workers showed up and helped block non-strikers from entering the building. This picture is not of that event, but it does show Ruth Crane with other picketers and a bit of a scuffle. By April 20th, 24-hour picket lines were set up outside of the Gwen factory. Gwen workers did not go on strike. However, many were sympathetic as workers there had relationships with those in the union. From my understanding, Gwen did not strike due to the impact it would have on the local community, as the factory was pretty much their one industrial plant. It was suspected that cut work from Ishpeming was being sent down there, so to stop this, strikers blocked the car of manager Harold Peterson, picture here in the car, from retrieving the items. This picture is actually from a little bit of a later date in early June, but the idea of what the strikers did is on full display. And in June, 25 of the women who blocked the car here were arrested for mass picketing. The apex of action occurred on April 23rd, when a woman unassociated with the strikes plowed her car into picketers outside of the Gwen factory. No one died, but three were seriously hurt and others injured. The woman claimed that she got excited and accidentally stepped on the gas. We'll never know if this act was deliberate or not, but the union did use it to their advantage and was able to gain sympathy from the community. This was big news and was reported throughout the country. Here are some snippets from Baltimore and Chicago. Uh, interesting aside, John Volker of Anatomy of a Murder and Trout Fishing fame was the county prosecutor at the time and was actually involved in the case. On May 23rd, both the Logansport and Huntington plant went on strike. Already unionized, these workers did not have the representational issues, but had similar grievances due to lowered rates for piecework, most notably that their expected raise of seven cents an hour went unrealized. Demands included a wage increase for piece workers of 19 cents an hour, six legal holidays, and a number of minor readjustments. Management came back with a four cent per hour raise, which was deemed unacceptable. Now the strikers in Indiana made sure to clarify that their action was not a sympathy strike. After the strike wave of the mid 1940s, the Taft-Hartley Act was passed in 1947, restricting labor activities and officially outlined sympathy strikes. This is not to say that they didn't recognize the advantage of going on strike while Ishpeming was. This really helped strengthen the Ishpeming strikers resolve and put greater pressure on management. Additionally, an exchange system was set up whereby two picketers from Ishmael visited the Logansport factory, while two lo from Logansport came up to the UP. This demonstrates a cohesion between the strikers of the different states and their effort to unite them against a singular cause. Geraldine Gordon even purported that one of the plants in Canada would strike as well, but I was unable to find, on, find any information if that actually happened. Now, not everyone in Ishpeming was thrilled about the strike. The iron ore proclaimed that the actions of the women would make old Joe Stalin pleased and that the FBI would be interested in their activities. Others against the strike included the Ishpeming Chamber of Commerce, Ishpeming City Council, and Rotary and Town Clubs. Sam Cahotis, pictured here, who made his money in the produce business, led the anti-labor efforts. Our administrative building on campus is named in his honor. 
In early June, the anti-labor forces requested that the governor intervene and send state police to quell the picketers. However, the mayor had to sign the request, which he would not do. In direct response to these efforts, the Committee to Preserve the Rights of Labor in Marquette County was formed. They held a large meeting on June 11th to garner support from the community. And this was not the first large gathering of the pro-labor side, but I decided to mention it because there are a plentiful amount of pictures available. This is Geraldine Gordon at the meeting. And here are the three mayors from Marquette, Nagani, and Ishpeming who all supported the union. Mayor Wiley on the right, who didn't sign the request, actually had a sister who helped organize the strikers. Further research should be done on this division between the Chamber of Commerce and the mayors because it, it really is quite compelling. Now there had been conferences between management and the unions of Michigan and Indiana throughout the strikes, but with little success. It was not until July that negotiations got serious. A conference was held in Detroit with the heads of the ILGWU, union reps from both Michigan and Indiana, the Michigan governor and his legal advisors, and the heads of Gossard. There, they agreed to a follow-up meeting, meeting at the Mather Inn in Ishpeming, pictured here. It was up here in Ishpeming on August 2nd that all three strikes were resolved. It's important to note with regard to the interconnectedness of the strikes that Ishpeming would only settle if the Indiana strikers got a resolution as well. It's also significant that it was resolved all the way up here in the UP. The reps from Indiana had to travel quite a distance, which just demonstrates the influence of the Ishpeming factory to the entire cause. So what'd they get? The Logansport and Huntington factories got a slight pay increase, back pay, and settlement of other minor grievances. The union in Ishpeming was able to procure a wage increase of six cents per hour, union security, and arbitration and seniority provision. Additionally, the charges against the 25 strikers who had been arrested for mass picketing were dropped. The strikes were very much a victory for the unions and a celebration followed in Ishpeming. Management's claim that they would be unable to afford a union factory never materialized, and they actually became more profitable in the years to follow. Here is an image of that party. Michael DeFont, the lawyer for the union who represented the arrested strikers, would go on to marry Geraldine Gordon. At the time of the strike, both were already married. Gordon went back to Chicago after the strike and divorced her husband, while DeFont did the same. She married DeFont and would come to live uh, the rest of her life in the UP. Here's an image of Ruth Crane at that party as well. I'd like to point out the ribbons that they're wearing. After discussing with numerous different people, I was unable to find or figure out what the, the symbolism of these ribbons were. So if anybody has any information on that, I would be happy to know. Now, this is a side-by-side -side of the Gossard of yore and the Gossard of today. The Ishpeming factory closed down in the mid-1970s as garment work was being outsourced. Today, it is the Pioneer Square Mall and has different shops and businesses inside, along with the Ishpeming Historical Society. This is where the Gwen factory was. I, I don't know if it occupied that specific building uh, and it is now private residences, but this is the address of where that factory was. Now, sadly, as seems the fate of many other Gossard factories, the Logansport plant was demolished in 1997. UP labor history is usually relegated to mining. So I think it's very important to recognize the labor action apart from that. Additionally, research on this pivotal and influential event is seldom and what has been done really only touches on the events in Ishpeming. I believe to really appreciate what these women and men did its interstate impacts must be recognized. Now, you might be curious as to why I, a male, chose to research really quite a feminist event. Well, I was raised in a family of strong women. Both my mother and grandmother are and were part of the teachers' union, so I dedicate this research to them. I'm also a Hoosier expat, so to have this UP Indiana connection intrigued me from the beginning. It's important to study and promote the legacies of events where individuals were brave enough to stand up for themselves. The Ishpeming strike should be discussed much more up here in the UP. One, because it was the first female-led labor action in the region, and second, because its impacts transcend Michigan's borders. Hopefully, with additional research and greater local recognition, this historic event will become much more popularized. 
It's been a privilege and a pleasure to present here at the Sonderegger Symposium. Thank you. Very nicely done, Sam. Thank you so much for that uh, very good presentation. Uh, at the moment, it does not seem that we have any questions. So if you guys want have anything else that you want to say, John and Sam, uh, go ahead and do it. I've got a question, Charles, and I'm going to join in because I'm uh, moderating the next session. So um, questions for John. Um, I, your topic, I've done a little bit of research around it as well. And one question I had is, um, with, with Berman's passing relatively soon thereafter the case and his imprisonment, um, did you find any evidence that his imprisonment had an effect on his health? Because I, I know a lot of the, the prisons at that time could be, the conditions are pretty rough, especially if you were an agitator. Um, and I'm wondering uh, if that had any impact, if you found it, because I, I couldn't find a, a obituary for him or anything that might lead to any kind of information. I'm wondering what you may have found. No, um, and let me use that question, Dan, to tell the other part of the story, since I think we've got uh, you know uh, plenty of time uh, to explore it. Um, let me give you a little background on Berman. Berman uh, was a immigrant from either Northern Finland or Northern Sweden, I think way up uh, where the two uh, join. And I'm not totally sure whether or not he's a straight Finn or a Swede Finn. I happen to, to have that similar kind of background as a Swede Finn. So it, it, you know, there's some interesting question just because of the fact that Berman did rise so, so strongly within the, the Finnish um, part of the party. Uh, in 1907, the earlier case that I was alluding to, and then maybe let me f fast forward to your question, Dan. In the earlier case, uh, Berman had just arrived in the Houghton Hancock area when they decided to test, uh, the Finnish Socialist Federation decided to test the red flag law that had been, uh, ordinance that had been put in. And they were doing it with a uh, support parade for the 1907 uh, Iron Range strike from Minnesota. Finns were out on strike in Minnesota. Huge group from Houghton Hancock then come down the uh, stairs of the local uh, Finn Hall with American flags first, and then they unfurled their red flags, were immediately arrested. Patrick H. O'Brien, who ultimately throws the book at Eminent and Berman later, is their defense attorney for Berman and the rest of the, the Finnish socialists. Berman is just the order of arraignment. He happened to be first in terms of the arraignment, so his name goes on the case. He wasn't really the organizer. The organizer, uh, Leo Lauke, a very famous Finnish radical, was part of that group. Frank Eltonen, there were a number of well-known local Finnish radicals or trade unionists who were also arrested. But the case goes up and ultimately is affirmed by the Michigan Supreme Court that finds no problem with the way that these men were arrested or with the actual uh, conduct of, uh, of the case. Fast forward, Berman becomes a, a Gogebic County area uh, labor organizer uh, working for the Western Federation of Miners trying to organize uh, iron miners. Ultimately, he moves down to Chicago, uh, Waukegan area, where he becomes a carpenter, and then ultimately moves to the UP in time to be the second that's charged in the, uh, in the case of the Red Flags in Eben Junction. Um, that specific Unity Co-op store in Eben Junction was used on three occasions as the home of district organizers for the Upper Peninsula. I can't help but believe that Berman actually was put into the Unity Co-op specifically to give him a basis for communist organizing in, across the UP, but out of the Eben Junction uh, community. Berman goes to jail and indeed, you know, working at hard labor, I think can have a toll on all of us. I think he was still young enough though, Dan, that I have to admit 55 you know, it very well may have been that he had underlying conditions or other things. 
I'm sure that some time at hard labor can, can you know, definitely um, um, take a toll on the body. But I have no, um, you know, proof positive that uh, that it actually did. Now I find it interesting comparing the two cases just because they're they're fascinating in that way. That O'Brien was a was a major liberal. You know, almost regarded as a radical in the copper country, ends up again uh, as the state attorney general, yet feels that he has to throw the book at his former uh, client, Pelle Berman. Interestingly enough, even though the case is cited in the Supreme Court case, no one mentions Patrick Bryan's earlier uh, um, role in the earlier case, nor do they mention that it's the same Berman. It, it never comes up in the trial transcript. It's fascinating stuff. Well, thank you so much for that answer, John. Uh, Sam, I've got a few questions for you. Um, the first one, uh, if you could show that picture with the ribbons again from your presentation, Hillary Joy uh, Vertanen wanted to see that. One second. Okay. And while that's up, you can answer, uh, after you get it up, you can answer some of the other questions that we've got. That's loading. Gotcha. I gotta go back. Yeah, so I had talked to a few different professors and Sandy Arsno um, about those ribbons, and we, I, you know, I've looked at things and I couldn't find, you know, what they're actually specific to, but they're all they're all wearing them at that uh, that party. Thank you, and uh, we have one question from uh, James Leary. Uh, there were clue at Peabody Aero Shirt factories on the Minnesota Iron Range. Uh, with all women workers, are there any uh, male minor female garment worker parallels? Yeah, I haven't looked into that so much, but specifically to the area and to contextualize a little more, um, in 1946, that's when the United Steelworkers of America had their massive strike, and Ishmeen was, you know, incredibly involved in that. So th this was this was only three years after that. So. The idea that one could strike successfully and get what they want, this was very much on the minds of the women. And they, the, the United Steelworkers helped out with their strike. And so they were very much willing to participate in more picketing and more action. Thank you. And uh, the okay. last one. Oh, oh, yes. But let me just say uh, uh, an aside. Remember that not all of those women were single women, but there were a number of single women who were factory workers. But many of them were also married and we're yes. to, to miners or to, to other trade unionists. And that's sort of, the, it's interesting in um, what happened in Gwen because they didn't strike there, but a lot of the women who worked there did have relationships with men and with men in unions and with women at the Ishmael factory. So that, it always, you know, really puzzled me as to why the, the really concrete reasons to why they didn't go on strike. But they eventually, and after the, after the strike, they did unionize, uh, which is interesting. All right, and the last one for you, Sam, from Katherine Johnson. Uh, just out of curiosity, how long did the Ishpeming strikers stay in jail? Did their lawyer or someone else immediately bail them out? Uh, did you discover any blacklisting as a result of the Gossard labor organizing efforts in the UP or Indiana? Um, nothing with the blacklisting, but I ass they, they were arrested and charged, but they weren't held in jail. The, the charges weren't so serious where they needed to be in, be jailed for a period of time, but they were they were charged. Um, and, you know, after everything was resolved, they dropped that. And it was, it's interesting to note with the Gossard, the, the police, and there's evidence that the police really, you know, supported, not supported, but were more, more or less indifferent to the female strikers. They didn't really try to break up too much. Um, at one point, they had burned an effigy of uh, the manager, Harold Peterson. Um, you know, unfortunately I didn't have time to go into that, but um, you know, there was just stuff like that going around and you know, no one got arrested for that. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't know if that's 
partially because there were women. And at the time they were, you know, somewhat taken a little less seriously um, compared to if you know, that had been done by a bunch of brutish mine workers. Um, so I could only speculate on that. All right, thank you. Uh, at the moment, we have no more questions. Uh, do you guys have anything else that you want to put in there or? Well, just a, an aside to Sam, that uh, you might check with the, uh, uh, the Marquette County Historical Society, because when you're dealing with issues like ribbons or buttons or other things along that line, they often get donated to museums. And so that the museum very well may have uh, one of those ribbons uh, in their collection. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll check that out. I, I looked through the, what the, everything that they had on the Gossard strike, but I didn't think to go in and ask specifically about that ribbon. So I'll, I'll go back and check with that. Now, yeah, because see, I, before I became a professor, I was a national director of education research for the paperwork attorney. Uh, oh, okay. And in my role, um, I was leading a lot of support activities for our various strikes and, and negotiations. So we often would use ribbons as a form of solidarity, mm -hmm. or, uh, buttons as a form of solidarity. I can't help but believe that what you have in that photo is victory ribbons. Yeah, that's, what, that's kind of what I concluded. And because they, they, there's no other pictures with them on it like during the strike, it's only at that after party that you see them wearing it. But it's fairly common, and uh, yeah, I would commend uh, your your uh, the historical society to you in terms of the fact that they might have them in a different place and not really even know what they are in relation to Gossard. Mm -hmm. uh, Adam Berger in the uh, Q and A suggests talking to Joe Whitler at MR MRHC and that she might have similar ribbons. All right, I'll look into that. Okay. Well, th I can't thank uh, all of the folks who, uh, who uh, have been part of this. Let me just uh, do a quick commercial. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, one thing that Dan was uh, talking about, Carl uh, was talking about, Jim's on the same list, is I run something at Michigan State University called Our Daily Work, Our Daily Lives, that looks at the intersection of work and culture broadly defined, including labor history. We're in the 25th year of our brown bag series. We do museum exhibits, concerts, films. Uh, we sponsor plays, poetry readings, and other things. If anyone is interested in, in what we're trying to do here at MSU with our daily work and daily lives, they can simply send me an email at beckj at msu.edu, and I'll put you on our emailing list because all of our presentations are now on Zoom. And many of our past presentations have been um, recorded and are available through the MSU library. So if you're interested in labor history, worker culture, broadly defined, please do get a hold of me at beckj at msu.edu. And I'd like to, to have you part of our larger community. All right, uh, thank you both so much for presenting. Uh, we don't have any more questions at the moment, so I think that we can call that an end to the panel. Uh, the next one is starting at four or at uh, three thirty and ten minutes in the same room. Folk music in the UP with uh, Dr. James Leary and Dr. Carl Rakonen. Uh, so that one should be an interesting one to see. That'll be moderated by Dan Truckee, who is already in the room as well. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. By the way, Sam, uh, drop me an email because uh, I'm always look for, looking for presenters. I think you would do a great uh, standing job within our Brown Bag series. Yeah, that'd be great. Hey, uh, John, have you done anything about the, uh, the uh, timber strike, 1937? Actually, uh, you might know that Deborah Bernhardt did her, uh, her master's thesis on the strike. And it's a first rate piece of research. The one thing I didn't mention, which is really interesting is Henry Paul is a very, very well-known labor attorney out of uh, um, Duluth. So he comes up for the 1937 woodworker strike since he's uh, uh, basically uh, their lawyer. And this crowd uh, surrounds him and his wife, Irene um, Paul. 
and they threaten him and they call him a, 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 an epithet for Jews. They, they call him a no good Jewish bastard. And they say, you were the guy that defended those communists in Evan Junction, because of course, a good amount of the strike was based in Alger County. Uh, so in that way, it's interesting how, you know, kind of the stories begin to weave together um, on, this, uh, on this kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I, wrote, I wrote a short article for the Chronicle of Michigan History about it. Um, uh, it was published a couple of issues ago. Um, and I used Deborah's article and uh, Bruce Cox's um, wrote a book um, focusing more on a Gogibic County because Paul then went to Gogibic County and was <laughs> was beaten up and dragged into Wisconsin by the strikers oh. or the uh, the mob in Gogibic County who were beat um, and uh, told to never come back to the state of Michigan. He ended up in the hospital in Ashland. Um, and uh, yeah, it's quite a story. I, if you're looking for anyone to present about that, I'd, I'd love to do that sometime. And there's a, there's a, it's it's really really fascinating. Irene Paul, if I remember rightly, and, and Jim or Carl might, I think that she was finished if I remember. Rightly. And the important thing about her is that she was a major poet in Minnesota. And uh, I think she wrote both under her own name and also uh, some of her stuff got published uh, in the labor press and elsewhere uh, without attribution. Um, but fascinating woman on top of her marriage to, uh, to Henry Paul. John, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that anti-Semitic trope that was shouted because in the Iron Ore, uh, Geraldine Gordon's official last name was Weisenthal, yeah. and she didn't she didn't use it. And they really called her out on that. You know, why was she hiding her last name? She's coming from Chicago, and you know, this outside agitator with you know mysterious Jewish backgrounds was just heavily implied, which is just you know very interesting. Well, and, and I knew Jerry Defont actually quite well when I was a young man in Escanaba, Sam because uh, I was a Democratic Party activist when I was in high school. And Jerry was uh, chair of the Marquette County uh, Democrats. Mm -hmm. um, she was a wonderful woman. I mean, I think that she was just, uh, just really quite something. Now, the other thing about uh, the ILG is given the fact that its birth came out of New York City and was really regarded as a Jewish union, the, the mm -hmm rebellion of the 10,000 and everything else that uh, birthed the union. You can see where uh, the local folks very well may know some of that history or at least be able to understand the ILG as quote unquote a Jewish union. Mm -hmm. Well, nothing you. like you know, being able to sit around a screen with, uh, with folks and talk about this stuff, right? <laughs> and uh you know for uh, jim and carl are are absolutely wonderful i have to unfortunately run but um good luck gentlemen in terms of uh, your time and dan treat them with kid gloves because they deserve oh yeah no I, i've got a long history with these two um they're 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 tougher than they look so you know make I, sure yeah well, I on the board with one of yeah. them. I know. And, and thanks so much for your presentations. They were they were truly excellent, and it just goes to prove that everything is connected one way or another. Well, and, and you know, Carl, uh, Finfest is always a, a great thing for all of us uh, to be able to uh, come together, and you know, it's a hearty group uh, that continue to 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 bring all that uh, history forward. So thanks for your work. Thanks for Jim's work. Thank you, Sam. And Charles, you did a wonderful uh, job. Uh, as Thank you very much. Thank you for that. And Dan, thanks for the uh, invitation. Oh, yeah. you're absolutely welcome. It was great having you and Sam, you too. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity, especially as an undergrad, to be able to. Oh, I was. Us. I think uh, as an undergrad, you, you distinguished yourself very, very well. And oh, Sam, I hope you're thinking about graduate school because obviously you've got uh, you've got the gift of gab for uh, for the uh, history. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely on my mind. I, I think Michigan State has a program. In it. Yeah, we do. 
And the other thing is that I would commend to you the idea that uh, there are a number of places and, and, you know, drop me an email saying we can talk about it uh, because there are great places to actually do labor history if that is the way that you want to, to uh, you know, continue to... Yeah, I've definitely been giving it a, a lot more consideration. Um, and I'm definitely, after just doing just this research on the hazard, there's so much more that I want to go into. And this hasn't been looked at or researched on the strike at all, which right. is just, it's just something in, in talking with uh, Phyllis Wong and Sandy Arsno about it, that we're just, we were just all sort of surprised about how this really hasn't been touched at all. And no one really has that much knowledge about it. Well, there's, um, I think that there's an oral history manuscript uh, that's been submitted. Uh, for yeah, yeah. Yeah, I talked to uh, Phyllis Wong about that. And she said that she's been working on it or trying to get it published. Yeah, so yeah. I think that that will help. But the other thing is, you know, what you're really alluding to is that there's a lot about women's work, especially in the UP and the unionization of women. Uh, Gossard is, a, is the, not the only example. There were mm -hmm. a number of, uh, of clothing factories, I think in Iron Mountain uh, and elsewhere. Uh, so I think that there's, a, there's a, quite an interesting history that you can play with. But I'm gonna ring off so that uh, the next group can start. But uh, thanks again for including me. I look forward to seeing all of you in the future. Okay. Have a good one. Great to see you, John. John. I'll jump off here as well. All right. Hey, Charles, thanks.